we did two big studies that are in fact complementary to each other. Let's say a, 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 the comparison of pro the prostitution policy of 21 European countries, where we can't go in great depth, but we have a huge comparison both across countries and uh, historically, because we look at a period of about 150 years. And then we have a second study where, with a very fine-tooth comb, we study in great detail both the formulation and the implementation and the effects on uh, the society, on the, on the target group of sex workers and on clients and on third parties of prostitution policy in Austria and the Netherlands. Now, you will have noticed that we are rather critical of how policies have developed in uh, both in the large uh, uh, 21 country study as well as in the more detailed two country studies. So is there a solution? Is there a better way to develop prostitution policy without getting caught into the morality politics of it all? And we think there is. And not only do we think there is, we can even point to instances where it has happened. The, the magic bullet, if I may use this a bit ironically, is, a, is what we call collaborative governance. Now, collaborative governance is a way for governments and uh, their target audiences uh, to enhance the capacity for governance, particularly in situations that are changing rapidly, that are where very few reliable facts are available, and um, um, where there is a lot of conflict and discord. And... Um, now, what is collaborative governance and what do we need to make it happen? Let me first tell you what it is, then what we need, and then let me give you the examples where we think it is happening right now, that we can learn from. So, collaborative governance has six characteristics. One, um, you need to create a forum, a platform, where all parties that are involved um, sit down together to discuss the policy, the formulation, the implementation, or whatever problems emerge in the realization of that policy. You need to particularly involve disadvantaged and vulnerable groups, groups that are always um, excluded from such conversations. Now, in our study we have a large argument, and I won't go into in detail now, which is based on uh, uh, things like complexity theory, why it is important to have a great diversity of views. But the, but the bottom line is basically the more diverse groups you bring together, the stronger the chance, the higher the chances that you will hit upon a creative solution or that you unleash the creativity that resides within society. That's one. The second is the collaborative forum must be authoritative. It must not be a sideshow to the real politics. That very often happens. So policymakers say, okay, invite people to sit down with them and talk about a particular policy, and, uh, um, and uh, then they make decisions in a totally other forum. Or what also happens a lot is so-called forum hopping. So you can't get what you want in in particular forum, so you get to another forum. So it must be authoritative. Third, it must be formal and not a casual arrangement. So it cannot be that, for example, one administrator says, all right, well, let's sit down together and see where, how far we get. No, it must, have, it must be authoritative and has certain formal rules, maybe even a, a little contract or some statutes. Um, it also often requires that particularly disadvantaged groups require some training to be able to participate fully in these collaborative governments. I've seen examples of that when citizens are um, invited into such forums and require all sorts of basic training, for example, in uh, chairing a meeting or writing, uh, drawing up minutes. You have to engage then, once you have co collected, created this forum, into joint problem definition and joint fact findings. Very important. Because people disagree about the nature of the problem, right? They disagree about what facts are relevant and what not, or what, which facts are valid and which not. So searching together for how to define the problem and, and, and find a body of evidence that is relevant to your problem is a very important process because you get to know each other. You get 
um, uh, uh, you, you, you develop the, ba the first basis, beginnings of trust that is required for such a collaborative arrangement to work. Um, you begin to move into a position of, uh, of so-called shared uncertainty. You begin to realize no one of us quite knows how this works, but together maybe we can make it work. And then very important, sort of the beating heart of collaborative governance is what uh, 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 some colleagues call authentic dialogue. So that is a form of dialogue that is uh, reciprocal, where everybody can challenge uh, what, what everybody else says, including the rules of the game, and um, that is also respectful, right? So the, the kind of highly emotive language that I talked about earlier has no place in a collaborative forum. So, and then finally, you need some form of leadership, but often leadership emerges in these collaborative forums, and that's instrumental leadership, but also moral leadership. So, now this might sound, and does sound, like a tall order that never works, right? Well, we have found instances where it does work, but you need very something very important. You need a well-functioning um, sex worker organization or sex worker advocacy organization that can work function as a partner in such a collaborative forum. And many countries have sex worker organizations. That's what our 21 country comparison shows. Some strong, some less strong, some you know older and, 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 and established, some less so. Um, interestingly enough, you don't find many unions and it has something to do with the fact that sex workers most of the time work individualistically. So the, the, the whole uh, the notion of uh, you know, the solidaristic and, and, and a collectivist uh, belief system behind unions doesn't apply so much, we think, to, to sex workers. So what you see is sex worker organizations that define themselves in opposition to the state, for example, to government. That doesn't mean they can't work with government. In fact, um, what we often see is that if sex workers' organizations are taken seriously, <coughs> they quickly take on all sorts of roles. Not just advocacy, not, they're not, you know, they move from a social movement much more towards a kind of multi-purpose organization, you could say, so providing services to sex workers, but also doing advocacy and consultancy work and advisory work. Now, where do we see this work? Let me give you first an example that was really was was started as a totally dismal and then transformed into a kind of collaborative arrangement and it's very typical for many of these collaborative arrangements. It's the city of Vancouver. So for many years, <coughs> the city of Vancouver uh, had a large outdoor sex work area and uh, where many uh, uh, of the sex workers were, were from minority ethnic uh, groups and the area was plagued by a series of murders, very brutal murders. I think, I don't know if they were ever solved, but quite a few women were, were murdered. Uh, there was, of course, outcry from the sex worker community, from other groups that were involved with sex workers, NGOs, etc. And there was also a big outcry against the way that the police handled these, the, this whole situation, which was quite brutal towards the sex workers. At some point there was a, 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 an, an understanding emerging, a shared understanding that this doesn't work. And this is what you often see. Collaborative arrangements emerge out of situations where people begin to see this doesn't work. You know, we've done, this isn't, this isn't going anywhere, it's just this replication of misery. And let's try something else. So the police and the sex worker advocacy organization and some local NGOs sat down together and hammered out a protocol for uh, the police that, that, that stipulated how the police should behave towards sex workers and um, uh, created a much larger and richer service system for sex workers. And that is still functional today. In fact, Vancouver is one of the few uh, Canadian cities where there is a, 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 a considerable measure of trust between the sex worker community and the police in this particular case. But there is a bigger example, uh, which I think 
can be an example for all of us who aspire to a more humane and more effective uh, prostitution policy, and that is the country of New Zealand. So I went to New Zealand twice to do research there, and I spoke to a broad range of sex worker advocates from the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective, uh, government officials, politicians, I spoke to the architect of the Prostitution Reform Act in New Zealand, um, I spoke to police officials, to administrators, and <coughs> what you see is a policy system where the NZPC, the Sex Worker Advocacy Organization, has an important role to play. So they advise the government on all new um, uh, uh, proposals uh, to change or to augment or to the, 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 the Prostitution Reform Act. Also they advise the government on local policy. They provide essential services, health services, but also uh, public health services and have contracts with the ministries. Oh, and, and they, by the way, employ um, uh, low threshold uh, offices in all cities where there is a prostitution scene in New Zealand. But what is particularly important is that everyone that I talk to in, in government circles, from the immigration service to the public health ministry to the politicians, spoke highly of the NZPC and its moral leadership. So Catherine Healy and uh, Callum Benaghi, the two spokespeople of the NZPC, they are the face of organized prostitution in uh, New Zealand. And the result is that the, 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 the public debate on prostitution is much more civilized than it is in most other countries. Prostitution has become something that's maybe not normal, but definitely accepted. And uh, also among the police. The police, again, speaks highly of their collaboration with the NZPC, even brothel owners. And brothel owners often um, you know, have conflicts with the NZPC. So, for example, they run a service where, a legal service, where sex workers who feel that they are, their labor rights are violated go to the NZPC. The NZPC then tries to first informally arrange it, which works most of the time. I've seen it happening, I was present in such a meeting, for example. But if that doesn't work, they can bring it to a mediation board, where several sex workers have won, because often it's a rather flagrant uh, violation of labor laws. And if that doesn't work, you go to court. But, and, and the NZPC helps a sex worker with all these steps. What you then have is a completely decriminalized uh, prostitution policy where just regular laws, labor law, fiscal law, administrative law, covers also prostitution and a strong sex worker organization that is always available to make sure that um, uh, the law is implemented properly, but also when new uh, you know, problems appear to bring in their own perspective and their own creativity to help solve that problem. And so we think that collaborative arrangements are the way to go in prostitution policy and to take it out of this kind of acrimonial, hostile, highly emotional morality politics that we have now in most countries. You need good organization of yes. sex workers. Yes, it's a, it's a condition. There are many countries have such organizations and it might require, as I said in one of the conditions of, uh, um, uh, of collaborative governance, that the government uh, uh, supports such organizations. So the NZPC gets financial support from the government. And, and they behold, I mean, they are accountable. Then they say they realize that. So, and, and, uh, uh, but it's not just financial support. It's also important that you um, give people the space, and the, 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 the possibility to grow into that role. I mean, the NZPC is now about 30 years old, I think, and they didn't start out like this. It's, it's, it's a slow process where they begin to develop and take on that role. So. It is possible. It is possible, yes, absolutely. And in Australia, New South Wales, we have something that is slightly different, but also have strong collaborative characteristics. So, yeah, it's possible. And we think this is the way forward.